How's it going everybody? Chaotic Meatball here and welcome back to the channel. So today I'm going to be hopping onto the trend of the monotype hardcore Nuzlocke because I wanted an excuse to play this game again, that being Black and White 2. Seriously, these games have some of the best battles and progression in the entire series. I have no idea why people didn't like Gen 5 when it came out, but I digress. I'll be taking on the games with a mono water type team, even though I said I'd do grass last week at the end of the Registeel video, turns out Sylph Spectre had actually already done that on his channel literally days before my last video went live. So I went ahead and shifted to water types, as Flygon HG did the fire type challenge in this game. However, I will be doing one major difference that neither of them were able to pull off, and that's playing this on challenge mode. See, challenge mode increases the levels of my opponents by 10%, gives bosses additional Pokemon and modified teams to be harder, not to mention held items and very well-balanced movesets, so we're gonna have a very, very hard time here. In case you don't know what a hardcore Nuzlocke is, let me give you a breakdown of the rules since there's quite a few. Rule number one, if a Pokemon faints, it is considered dead and must be permaboxed. Rule number two, I can only catch the first water type or first Pokemon that evolves into a water type on each route. This one's a bit weird with how I play since I do selective dupes clause, which means that if there's a brand new water type encounter on the route, along with a previously encountered uh, Pokemon that I've already caught, I can continue to re-roll for the first new water type on the route, but if all encounters have been captured on the route, but it has water types, I can grab the first duplicate I see. It's a bit weird, but it seemed like the path of least resistance when it came to putting together the team for this challenge. Rule number three, no items in battle except for Pokeballs for catching wild Pokemon. Held items are also okay. Rule number four, I'm not allowed to level Pokemon past the level of the next gym leader or first Elite Four member's ace. Rule number five, I'll be playing on set mode, and rule number six, nickname every Pokemon. With all that said, it's plug before the challenge time, so make sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel. Half of my audience is unsubscribed, apparently. You may think you're subscribed because you keep getting my videos recommended to you, but you're not. Go down there. Also, make sure to go ahead and hit that like button. I want to see 2,000 likes hit within the first week of this video's publishing. Comment down below what other monotype hardcore nuzlocks you'd like to see, among other challenges. Follow me on Twitch, Twitter, and join my Discord. Links are all in the description. And last but not least, I've restructured the Patreon recently. And we're already up to nearly $100 a month over there. My short-term goal is to hit $300 a month over there so I can pay my editor more. Shoutouts to Arantula. And if we do, I'll be starting a Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee shiny-only Professor Oak challenge. I'm dead serious. So let's go ahead and talk about the Water-type Pokémon that I'll have available in this challenge to me. There's a really good number of them, actually. Uh, we can get Oshuat, Psyduck, Azuril, Eevee, which eventually evolves into Vaporeon, uh, Panpour, Ducklet, Basculin, Frillish, Alomomola, Staryus, Feel, Remoraid, Mantike, Seal, Pelipper, Lapras, Breezel, Corsola. There's so many different water types in this game that I should be able to get through the game without having to use a single duplicate Pokemon in my team. But if I can't, I'll still have the spare encounters from other areas to rely on. Starting off, I'm able to get my starter, Oshawott. This is a gift Pokemon, so I didn't encounter it, so I'll be saving as pretty a city for later on when I have Surf. I name it Yosh because I was thinking of Sonic Adventure 2 and the sound that Eggman makes when you jump. I'm not sure why, I just was. And immediately jumped into a rival battle against you. Pun entirely intended. Is that even a pun? I don't even know. I have no chance to level up before him though, so he has the single level advantage with Snivy as I send an Oshawott as we are playing on challenge mode. I go for tackle and do more damage on Snivy, getting a critical with my second tackle before finishing him off with my third, getting two levels off of the fight because Gen 5 XP is kind of wonky. So yeah, pretty easy. We actually don't have too much up until we get to Flossa Sea Ranch, which is where our second encounter will be. I can get either Azuril or Psyduck here, and I'm hoping for the latter, but unfortunately I get Azuril. So I name it Why You, because why did you get in my way? Well, I guess I'll have to get its friendship up before the fight against Charon to evolve it into Meryl, but since I'm apparently really lucky, this Azuril has huge power, an amazing ability that doubles the attack stat of Azuril, and it will be carried on through Meryl and Azumarill. An automatic doubling of power is super insane this early in the game, and we will 100% take that. 
as Meryl and Azumarill will get eventually a ton of great physical moves like Rollout, Aqua Tail, Waterfall, and so on. With that encounter though, it's time to EV train, and I know for sure that Route 19 is the best place to do so. The only encounters here are Purloin and Patrat, which give speed and attack EVs respectively, so this is great for Azuril specifically. Though I do have to keep in mind the level cap of 14, as of course I'm on challenge mode so it's a little bit higher. This just led me to run back and forth on speed up for quite a bit of time so that I'd be able to max out Azuril's happiness ASAP, evolving it into Meryl before that cap. After getting to level 10 though, it's time to progress the story with another rival fight. Q leads with Snivy, who doesn't quite have a Grass-type move yet, so there isn't anything to worry about. I just use Defense Curl and roll out with Meryl to take it down in two shots, winning the fight. I'm surprised that they didn't change Snivy's moveset for this fight, but hey, I will take no resistance from a Grass-type attack. After rescuing this couple's Herdier, it's time for another quick grinding session. First of all, I took on Charon's trainers to get some extra EXP, though in hindsight, it would have been smarter for me to just EV train more on Route 19 and skip them, but I figured the additional money would be a bit more useful. With them defeated, it's time to talk about another strategy I utilized a ton in this run, edging. No, I'm not talking about the masturbation technique. Essentially, what this means is that though the level cap is set in stone, I can still gain EXP with my Pokemon up until right before it levels past the cap, which can allow my Pokemon to level up again during the fight, which is allowed since the level cap only stays until before the battle begins, which can give me an edge as I'll definitely need that while working against advanced movesets later on in the game. Once both Oshawott and Meryl are edged up to near level 15 and given Orin Berries, it's time to take on Charon, who has three Pokemon. He starts with a level 12 Patrat, so I go for Meryl, setting up a Defense Curl before going for a Bubble Beam. I need to do this to do just enough damage to make Rollout only need to land four times to KO all three of his Pokemon, but he goes for Workup, outspeeding next turn and landing a nasty tackle that does quite a bit of damage, thankfully alleviated somewhat by the Orin Berry. It goes down to the second shot of Rollout as he sends in Lillipup, his ace. It's able to land a tackle before going down to the third hit of Rollout, and Pidov does the same on the fourth hit without outspeeding and landing anything, winning me the basic badge in quick fashion. Well shoot, didn't even need Oshawott, but it's still good to have contingency plans and Pokemon grinded up in Nuzlocke as critical hits and various other problems like accuracy can and will screw you over wherever possible. Now that our level cap has increased to level 19, we get a massive power boost since both Meryl and Oshawott will be able to evolve, but sadly we won't be able to add another member to the team due to the lack of water type encounters on Route 20 and in the Verbank Complex until we get Surf. There's no rival battles, there's no real story progression, I just arrived in Verbank City, taking out the trainers in the complex and in the gym, edging up right before leveling past 19 before taking out Roxy evolving Oshawott into Dewat and Meryl into Azumarill in the process, of course. I'll at least do a little bit of a team recap here, since there's basically no action between gym leaders, so I'm sitting with a level 19 Dewat with a moveset of Tackle, Tail Whip, Water Gun, and Razor Shell. Razor Shell is definitely my best attack here, the rest of them are relatively garbage, and Azumarill is at level 19 with Water Gun, Bubble Beam, Rollout, and Defense Curl. I forgot to mention it before, but Defense Curl, if used before Rollout, actually gives it double power, meaning we get both a double power boost from Huge Power on top of a double power boost from Defense Curl, meaning the first attack of Rollout in and of itself is 120 power, second is 240, third is 480, and so on and so forth. Essentially, it's just a two-turn murder button for anything in my way, especially this early in the game, and I'm planning on making extremely good use of it. Roxy starts off with a coughing at level 17, so I go for Duot to start off using Razor Shell for around half as she goes for Venishock. We do the same next turn as Duot's Orin Berry is activated, healing a bit before the third Razor Shell manages to finish off coughing, leading to Grimer. I manage to get two Razor Shells in before Grimer takes too much HP away from Duot with Venishock, so I swap for Azumarill, thank goodness that the Fairy type doesn't exist yet, taking a Venishock before going for Defense Curl next turn. She uses Disable, fortunately right after Defense Curl, so that was a waste of a turn on her part, and it's just a sweep from there as Rollout hits once, barely missing the KO on Grimer as she poisons Azumarill, but since I planned for this, I gave a Pecha Berry to Azumarill before the battle for added protection, leading to a 2-hit KO after a Super Potion from Roxy, leaving just Whirlipede. 
It's a bug type, so unsurprisingly enough, Rollout is a one-shot, finishing the battle with no casualties. Two badges down and no deaths, I'm quite happy about this. I'm actually going to let you guys in on a little secret. I've never finished a Nuzlocke before, so this is a bit more invigorating compared to the other challenges I normally do, and using this much strategy is actually super fun. After chasing off Team Plasma, I'm finally able to head to the Unova mainland in Castalia City, and we've actually got a ton of neat stuff to get around here. First of which, though, we have to take out the Castalia Sewers, which houses the extremely useful Leftovers item. I'm surprised that they hand you this so early on in the game, but I will 100% take it since Azumarill with Leftovers and one-shotting everything with rollout and healing between each, like, knockout? <laughs> this is so broken, I love it. Hugh is also here with us, which means I can't go get my next encounter just yet, but after getting rid of more Team Plasma goons, I'm able to head up to the Castalia Park. The only encounter I'm able to get here is Eevee, so I just run back and forth, finally finding one after a few minutes and chucking a few balls at it, eventually getting it and naming it Skarm. I was actually watching a Farfa Yu-Gi-Oh stream while playing this, and it got me thinking of the Burning Abyss monsters, so I figured naming him Skarm would be appropriate. Would have definitely named Eevee Beatrice if it was female, but we'll take what we're given. I'm actually unable to access a Water Stone until before the fourth gym, but that is actually found through the Battle Subway, and I'm not exactly keen on losing my Pokemon to the Battle Subway before Elisa, so I'm probably going to wait until after that gym to get the Water Stone. Lastly, I'm able to grab the EXP share from the Battle Company. This is extremely useful in hardcore Nuzlocke rules, as it not only levels up your weaker Pokémon, like how Eevee currently is, it also makes a Pokémon an EXP sink, meaning you can put a low-level encounter that you don't plan on actually using for a while, slap the EXP share on it, and get your team closer to the level cap to make trainers in the section easier. I'll definitely be taking advantage of this many times throughout the run, but since we only have the Castalia Gym remaining, it's not the most useful thing right now, but it will at least help Eevee get up in levels with the rest of the team. So, after leveling to 26 and edging up, it's time for Berg. My team's sitting with Azumarill with Aqua Tail, Double Edge, Rollout, and Defense Curl, a massive upgrade from the last gym. Duot's sitting here with Return, Fury Cutter, Water Pulse, and Razor Shell, definitely better but still needs work, and Eevee here with Sand Attack, Growl, Quick Attack, and Bite. Quit Sand Attack could come in handy if I need to use it, but I don't think it'll be super useful here. We'll wait until Elisa for that. Berg leads with Dwebble, and it has Sturdy, so I'm in a bit of a pickle here. But I lead with Azumarill and go for the classic Defense Curl rollout combo, taking it out in two shots and leading to Lee Vanny. I did not expect him to throw it out this quickly, let's hope that Rollout takes it out, but he outspeeds. Fortunately, missing Grass Whistle as it's a completely inaccurate move, as Rollout KOs, leaving just his Shellmet and Carablast to get crushed in Azumarill's way. Winning me the fight with nearly full HP, <laughs> that's pretty good. Too bad, Berg, your bugs got squashed by the best Rock-type move in the game! So here's where the run gets scary. See, I'm at this point on my first attempt of the Nuzlocke, so I'm worried about a few things in this section. First of which is Colrus, who has a good number of Electric-type moves on both his Magnemite and Clink, but I don't think he will be a problem since he's relatively low level. As expected, he wasn't too bad. He did paralyze Duot and took her to half HP, but I was able to finish off both his Magnemite and Clink very easily and moved on. There's no new water encounters on Brock 4 until I get Surf, and nothing in the Desert Resort and Relic Castle, so I just moved on through Joint Avenue, saying as many cringe things as possible to get the people in here to shut up, and moved on into Nimbasa City. I ignored everything here for the time being, since there's a new encounter in Lost Lorn Forest that I'm shotgunning for, so I took out the trainers on Route 16 and inside the forest itself in order to capture Panpour. I tried naming it Poof, but apparently the game didn't like that. Not sure why, since I don't know anything that could be remotely offensive about that, so I just nicknamed it Rejected, as the game did to me with my original totally non-offensive nickname. With Panpour on the team, it's time to take out the trainers in Nimbasa, those being the multi-battle with Rosa against the Subway bosses Ingo and Emmett, as well as the people in the former and current Nimbasa gym. The gym did actually have a little bit of a scare for me as Duat got taken all the way down to 8 HP, but I survived the Ella Kid, so I was able to finish off the trainer, finishing everyone else off, and now I must think. I will die to Elisa unless I play this extremely specifically. She has an Amulga, Flaffy, Joltik, and Zebstrika. My entire team will die if I am not careful, 
and the most bulky thing I have on my team is Azumarill, who I need to sweep with Rollout or else I will be screwed. So there's a few things I can do to help myself here. First of which is the TM for Light Screen in Nimbasa City itself. I can go buy that at the Pokemart and teach it to Azumarill. Secondly, I need Cherry Berries for both Eevee and Azumarill specifically to play around Static and Thunder Wave. Fortunately, I can get one from a Pokemon Ranger in Lost Lorne Forest, but the second I need, so I can only do this by teaching Thief to Panpour and stealing them off of Wild Emulga, who also have Static. You want to know how many Cherry Berries were consumed in an effort to steal one without getting it immediately used? If you guessed one, two, three, or four, you'd be incorrect. It took me five. Seriously. Cerebi and Bulbapedia clearly have been using the wrong number. It is not a 30% chance of static activating, it's a 30% chance of static not activating. It's 70! They swapped the numbers around, and I know it because of how much experience with this I have screwing me over with this stupid ability in every single Pokemon game I play. I can't play a Kanto game without Surge doing it. I can't play a Johto game without Surge doing it. I can't play a Hoenn game without Watson doing it. I can't play a Sinnoh game without Volkner doing it. I can't play a Unova game without Elisa doing it. I can't play a Kalos game without Clamont doing it. I can't play an Alola game without Sophocles doing it. And I can't play a Galar game because Galar is a <laughs> terrible region! <sighs> Alright. It's time to calm down. Let's take a break, and we'll get into the Elisa battle after this ad break. With the whole team at level 32, let's go over the strategy. I lead with Eevee. It's holding a Cherry Berry, and it has Sand Attack, Charm, Return, and Bite. We will be accuracy stalling Flaffy, as Eevee is slower than Emolga, but faster than Flaffy, the 100% switch in based on the coding of AI in relation to moves like Volt Switch, U-Turn, etc. The swap after maxing out Sand Attack is Azumarill, which will be holding a Cherry Berry as well with Aqua Tail Light Screen rolled out in Defense Curl. This should be enough to alleviate Static and Errant Thunder Waves that may possibly hit, even through minus 6 accuracy. And Light Screen lets me live through multiple Volt Switches, and assuming Rollout doesn't miss, I can sweep with all 5 hits. The other two are probably not going to be used. I do not want to lose anything, because... I'm already limited enough as is with the amount of encounters I have, so wish me luck. She leads with Emolga, so I go for Eevee, clicking Sand Attack as she goes for Volt Switch, going into Flaffy as planned. I get it to minus two before it lands the first Thunder Wave. This consumes the Cherry Berry and I get the other four off without another Thunder Wave hitting, swapping for Azumarill and getting up Light Screen before, of course, a Thunder Wave at minus six lands and consumes my Cherry Berry. She misses again as I set up the defense curl, then it's rollout time. To prove my point, the 70% chance that static activates goes off on the first hit of rollout, but I'm actually lucky enough to where it doesn't affect Azumarill whatsoever. KOing Flaffy in two hits, Emolga in one, Zebstrika in one, and Joltik, after whittling Azumarill down to 6 HP after two volt switches, goes down to the final attack of rollout, winning me the fight with no losses. Oh, thank the Lord, oh thank you for not making me have to do this entire part of the game again. Honestly, I don't think I could have done this any differently, and I wasn't about to risk going into the battle subway and getting BP for water stones and losing Pokemon in there. And there really wasn't any other held items I could have gone with. But hey, we're past it. As long as I don't wipe for the rest of the game, I never have to deal with Elisa with mono water types ever again. After chasing off Team Plasma, I was able to head over to Route 5, and since I cleared the trainers out before Lisa, the only one I have to fight is the Heartbreaker. Moving on to the Driftvale Drawbridge, where I can get my next encounter, Ducklet. Now for the kicker! Normally the level cap is 33 on normal mode for this area, but because we're on challenge mode, Clay's Excadrill is level 36 instead, meaning I can evolve both Ducklet and Duat for this fight. Not to mention, I can actually get into Charged Stone Cave before the gym as well, meaning I can finally evolve Panpour and Eevee as well. The fact that our team is gaining this much power before a ground-type gym of all things is absolutely hilarious, especially since the last one was electric and we had to get through it and it made me angry. But you know, that's just the way the cookie crumbles, I guess. There's nothing in terms of tough boss battles in this section though, so after grabbing my water stones, I just leveled everything up to 36, grabbing the first Azumarill I encountered, since there's nothing else I can really get in this route, on Route 6 of course. 
Though, actually come to think of it, I guess I technically didn't have Basculin at this point. Since I didn't have Surf, I couldn't really get it right now. Eh, who cares, it's my first water and type encounter for the route. I'm just gonna grab it. I named it Bungus at least, because it's a big Bungus. That unfortunately this time doesn't have huge power, so this one's practically useless. One edging session later, and it's time for Clay. He leads with Krokorok, so I just go for Samurott, immediately starting with Water Pulse as he torments, but I one-shot as Onyx comes in second. Since Torment prevents successive uses of the same move, I went for Razor Shell on Onyx, bringing it down to 1 HP with Sturdy as he goes for Rock Polish, doubling his speed and healing next turn with a Hyper Potion. Of course, this resets Sturdy, so I just Water Pulse to take him to 1 HP again, and next turn he outspeeds and flinches me with Rock Slide, then does it for a second time, but the third doesn't flinch, so I'm able to finish him off with Razor Shell, leading to Sand Slash. This thing dies every time it smells a special attack, so of course Water Pulse takes it out, leaving just Excadrill. Razor Cell takes him down to less than half HP, even through a Citrus Berry, and it lowers his defense, not that it matters, going for Bulldoze to slow down Samurott just enough to outspeed next turn and go for the Rock Slide. But he doesn't flinch out Samurott, letting me hit a Water Pulse for the KO and the victory. I'm pleased. Very pleased with that. Always love a single Pokemon sweep in a Nuzlocke. Then again, it's not like I know the feeling of doing that from Nuzlocke's just solo and regular team challenges. One Pokemon World Tournament that only consists of 8 people later, and it's time for another Team Plasma Chase-Off session. And now it's actually time for a whole boatload of encounters. See, Charon gives us the HM for Surf on Route 6 now that I have the Quake Badge, meaning it's time to go back to all of the different areas that we couldn't get Water-type Pokemon from before, starting with this pretty city. I caught a red-striped Basculin here, a blue striped one on Route 19, another blue striped one on Route 20, seriously there's nothing else I can get in some area so I may as well load up on some food. Verbank Complex can get me a Jellicent at a 5% rate in Whippling Water, so if I just repel and avoid all of the Frillish, I can reroll all of my Basculins to grab it, but unfortunately I'm an idiot and run away. Good thing I can get one in Verbank City proper, as I would have just used the encounter on Frillish if I had caught Jellicent in the Complex. The last encounter I can get now is over on Route 4, where I can get a Loma Mola. This could potentially be useful as a big bungus that's just a giant wall like Blissey could be, but for now I'm just going to add Jellicent to the party to absorb as much EXP from the upcoming trainers as possible. All of the trainers throughout Chargestone Cave were a breeze, and taking everyone out on Route 7 and the Celestial Tower was pretty fun but I did almost scare myself by forgetting that gym trainers exist, instead grinding my Pokemon on the Autonos on Route 7, though I did catch myself in time, taking them out and finishing off the edging before challenging Skyla. I didn't actually try that much with the edging this time, I was starting to get a little lazy, and it's gonna show in the next few sections. Team recap time, and I've got Swanna holding a flying gem with the moves Fly, Bubble Beam, Tailwind, and Air Slash. Decent move set here, Air Slash for flinching, Tailwind for helping the rest of the team if needed since Skyless Flying type Pokemon are fast, and the other two moves are just good stab moves. Second is Vaporeon holding the Rocky Helmet with the moves Sand Attack, Charm, Strength, and Surf. It's honestly becoming the HM user with the occasional usage of Surf and Sand Attacking the most threatening of Pokemon on our opponent's teams. Third is Jellicent holding the Ghost Gem with Ominous Wind, Rain Dance, Surf and Recover. Good two support moves, good two stab moves, enough said. Fourth is Azumarill holding the leftovers with Aqua Tail, Super Power, Rollout, and Defense Curl. Seriously broken moveset along with huge power and Defense Curl is still putting in amazing work, so I'm keeping it for as long as possible. Fifth is Simipore holding the Water Gem with Thief, Acrobatic, Surf, and Scald. The latter two were the first two moves I'd go for, and then follow up with Acrobatics for the double power without a held item. Lastly, I've got Samurott with Return, Revenge, Surf, and Razor Shell. Nothing crazy, just good coverage with a Fighting-type attack, but that won't be useful for this fight. Skyla leads with Swoobat, so I go for Samurott, taking an Energy Ball for around 40% damage before taking it out with a single Surf, leading to Sigilyph. It goes for Psychic, doing a pretty decent chunk of damage as well before going down to a Critical Surf, with Skarmory out third. Samurott's at pretty low HP, not quite red, but since Starmory has Sturdy, I can't one-shot, so I go ahead and swap into Jellicent to take an attack, but he goes for Agility instead, outspeeding next turn and going for Aerial Ace, but thanks to Jellicent's Cursed Body ability, it's disabled as I go for Rain Dance. 
Since it's disabled, he's only got X Scissor and Steel Wing to hit me with, both resisted, so I can just use Recover next turn and follow up with Surf, doing over half after Citrus Berry and the second KOs, leaving just Swanna. She goes for Feather Dance like an idiot, since Jellicent doesn't use any physical attacks, so I just go for the Ghost Gem boosted Ominous Wind, doing nearly half as the rain ends. Since I'm slower, she has the ability to flinch stall with Air Slash, but the first time it lands, it gets disabled thanks to Cursed Body. So I just shift over to Recover next turn, since she has nothing to hit me with aside from Surf, giving me the edge. Next turn, I hit an Ominous Wind, getting the Omni Boost and popping the Citrus Berry, giving me just enough damage to KO with the third, winning the fight, and continuing to go flawlessly through this run. No deaths, six badges, life is good. Now that I've got all of that handled, I can get the Lucky Egg from Professor Juniper and fly on over to Lentimos Town, but there's really nothing interesting around here as neither the Strange House or Reversal Mountain has any new encounters for me. So I just move on through, emerging in Undella Town, and just in time for a bunch of new encounters. Here in Undella Town, I can surf into a rippling spot to get Staryu. Over in Undella Bay, during the winter, I can grab Sfeel. Unfortunately, there's a 5% I can get Remoraid, but I figured the chance of that was unlikely in comparison to the very high likelihood of a dupe's rerolled or the desired Sfeel. And now, I must think. We've got another rival battle coming up against Hugh, and his level 45 superior is extremely strong, having a good physical attack on Leaf Blade and a good special attack on Mega Drain, threatening my entire team with the exception of Swanna. So I went back to the exterior of Reversal Mountain and trained my team on Audino, getting up to level 45 with the whole team, as the level cap for this section is 52. But there's so many different areas that I can't really go insane with overleveling for this, despite the large amount of encounters of available to me now. I did a few other things as well, such as reteaching Azumarill Light Screen over Superpower in order to hedge against Mega Train, though none of my Pokemon are able to learn Reflect, so I can't really do much in terms of preventing extremely high damage from Leaf Blade. I was about to fight him too, but then I chickened out. I said, you know what? I'll figure out a way to play against the level cap later. I need a few more levels for Hugh, which ended up being a smart idea, as I raised my team to level 48, giving them a few different held items and went in for the battle. Hugh leads with Unfezen as I go for Azumarill, thinking for a bit before going for Defense Curl, using it twice as I see him go for Razor Wind, but he goes for it again, so I just use two more, and then do that routine once more to max out, setting up Light Screen and getting crit with Razor Wind. Sadly, this is where Azumarill's downfall comes, as he heals with a Hyper Potion after Rollout lands, but that doesn't really help since it just doubles in power, KOing and leading to Superior. And here's our first death. Superior goes for Coil, barely preventing himself from going down to Rollout, and following up with a Critical Leaf Blade to KO. Honestly, I think this would have been absolutely fine if it wasn't a critical, a 1 in 16 chance, since I was plus 6 defense with over half HP and he was only plus 1 attack, but hey, mistakes happened. It's not like I could have played around it to swap because I was locked into rollout, so it's fine. I just went to Semipore going for acrobatics and KOing, leaving just Simiseer to go down to Surf. A shame, really. Huge power was super useful for this challenge, but that's fine. I just re-added Vaporeon to the team since I had removed it for Wall Rain earlier. Before moving on though, I headed over to the Seaside Cave north of Indela Town in order to pick up a Golduck as my encounter. This place also has Seal, but honestly, Golduck is such a better encounter, especially considering we're going to be getting another great Water Ice type soon, and Dugong really does not fit that mold. After making my way through Route 13, opting to neglect the encounter here for now, Lankanosa Town and Route 12, I made it to the Village Bridge. This is where one of the best encounters of the game is, and that is Lapras. Unfortunately, it's very low rate in which I can encounter it in the Rippling Water, and it has Parish Song. But fortunately, everything else in the Rippling Spots I've already caught, so I can re-roll the encounter, not to mention I have a Master Ball to prevent this thing from being able to mess up my plans for it. Welcome aboard, Glacia, but now I have another challenge that I can completely avoid, but because I decided to be an idiot, go for it anyway. The trainer on the bridge itself has a Durant and a Lucario, and is a known run killer to Nuzlockers of Black 2, White 2, but I powered through with a combination of Samurott, Swanna, and Jellicent, taking him down and showing how easy this fight can be if you play carefully. 
With that, there's really nothing to worry about over on Route 11 except for a new encounter that I also opt to pass up since I don't need it, arriving in Opelucid City. Not really anything I want to do here yet, but since there's still a good amount of trainers to crush over on Route 9, I figured I'd go do that first, but not enough to get me to the level cap just yet. With them out of the way though, all that's left is the gym, and you know what this needs? A good ice type move! Fortunately, I can get the TM for Blizzard over in Lakanosa Town, and slap that on Walrein, Vaporeon, and Simipore, then I can head to the PWT in order to teach Hail to Walrein using a heart scale. This should be enough for me to crush the gym, and after finishing off the trainers and raising the team to level 52, the crushing did commence. Drayden leads with a Thrudagon as I go with Walrein, setting up the hail and taking a rock slide for around half, but thanks to both the ability Ice Heal and Leftovers, I healed 1 eighth of Walrein's HP, hitting a Blizzard next turn to KO and level up to level 53 leading to Flygon. It hits Rock Slide and flinches, but the damage is almost essentially negated thanks to Ice Body and Leftovers, allowing me to follow up with Blizzard next turn to KO, same with Altaria on the following turn leaving just Haxorus. I go for Blizzard, but since the hail stopped, it missed, letting him land Dragon Tail and Dragon Swanna, so I swapped for Vaporeon, using an Ice Gem boosted Blizzard to KO, following a Dragon Dance and a big Shadow Claw hit, KOing and winning me the Legend Badge. Seven badges down, one death, pretty damn good if I do say so myself. There's a few little team plasma battles after the region becomes a Vanillux, and with those I'm able to head back into Undella Town and head through the Marine Tube to arrive in Humalau City. I figured I'm just gonna grab the encounter here since it's convenient, getting Corsola, which is a neat combination of the water and rock types, but being four times weak to grass really makes me hesitant to use it. Taking out the trainers on Route 22 wasn't a problem either, so with those done, I just raised my Pokemon up to level 55, including Lapras, who I decided to EV train in both Special Attack and Speed, even though Lapras is a bit slow, I think having this maxed out will help immensely in certain situations later on. Though I did forget once again that gym trainers are a thing, but it wasn't a problem as I managed to make it through, edging my Pokemon and facing off against Marlin with a bit of a shakeup of the team since I'm using Samurott, Swanna, Lapras, Walrein, Vaporeon, and Starmie now. Lapras and Starmie both get Thunder, so setting up Rain Dance and wiping through Marlin's team is definitely the play here. He leads with Waylord, so I go for Vaporeon, going for Sand Attack as he gets a critical, doing massive damage with Earthquake, as I keep going for Sand Attack, maxing out and eventually healing near full as he sets up Rain Dance. We go for so long that it runs out after I hit my first Surf, so I go for Rain Dance with Vaporeon, swapping to my newly trained Starmie, KOing Waylord with Surf and leading to Karakasta. Of course, this thing is sturdy, so Thunder isn't able to one-shot, but it does consume his Citrus Berry, as Starmie takes a crunch but goes down to a Surf. Jellicent's out next, and Starmie's not going to be able to survive anything at this HP, so I just swapped again for Vaporeon, taking a few Energy Balls as Sand Attack lowers it down using Ray Dance to power up my attacks and swapping for Lapras in order to take it down with an Electric Gem boosted Thunder, leaving just Mantine. It goes for Confuse Ray, and because my Pokemon are idiots, Lapras decides to hit itself three times in a row as Air Slash lands a few times, making the rain disappear, but I said screw it, clicked Thunder after snapping out, fortunately hitting and picking up the KO, winning the fight in the last badge. Not happy that I had to use that much Sand Attack, but hey, we'll take it. So, there's a few boss battles between Marlin and the League, specifically against Colrus, Black Kirim, and Getsis, all of which are really nasty threats with a ton of super effective attacks for my team, and I'm fully prepared to lose a few Pokemon during this part of the game, since there's practically no avoiding it. Sadly though, one of those losses was definitely not what I was expecting, as Starmie happened to accidentally go down to an errant trainer with a Heracross inside of the Seaside Cave. So that was extremely frustrating, but I can't say that I'm surprised. It's a glass cannon and being used this far in without much protection isn't a wise decision. Oh well, I still have a good amount of Pokemon for use, so I just brought back Jellicent into the team and moved on with life, eventually clearing the Plasma Frigate out of Route 21 and into the Giant Chasm. I trained most of my party up to level 59 in preparation for the second round of fights on the Frigate, going into the fight against Colrus. He leads with Magneton, so I start with Lapras. I taunt it Bulldoze before this fight over Thunder in order to take on his team. 
I'm able to do quite a bit of damage before getting paralyzed and taking down to relatively low HP as Magnazone is swapped in. So I swap for Zamorot, getting nailed with a critical discharge, and since I didn't really have a good swap, I sacked Zamorot to get into Vaporeon, finishing off Magnazone with two Surfs and leading to Kling Clang. It has an air balloon, but that doesn't matter as Surf is able to two-shot it after Vaporeon barely survives a Giga Impact. So I swap into Jellicent as BEM comes in, setting up Rain Dance and alternating into Recover and Ominous Wind, KOing pretty quickly and letting Magneton come in just to die to Surf, leaving just Matang, an easy two-shot thanks to Surf again, winning the match. Losing my starter, <laughs> it really hurts. Uh, it was n in vain at least as the rest of the team was able to pull off the victory relatively simply, leaving just Black Kyurem and gets us. I swapped Samurott out for Simipore and trained it up to level 60 since I'll be using it to take out Black Kyurem exclusively. If it goes down, I have a great follow-up, but this is Simipore's role. Surprisingly enough, Flying Gem Acrobatics into Critical Blizzard is an easy two-hit KO on Black Kyurem, leaving just gets us. Well, shoot, I'll take that. I was scared of this thing running through my entire team with Fusion Bolt, but I was super lucky for sure. Gets his time and he leads with Kothagrigus, and since I still have Simipore up first, I have to lead with him. KOing with a Scald and Surf match with the burn from Scald, leading to Electros off of the back of a Simipore poison. I swap for Vaporeon and start going for Sand Attack here, taking a few Thunderbolts and maxing out the negative accuracy before going for Surf myself. Doing over half as Thunderbolt misses, going for two more Sand Attacks to get more recovery before finishing it off with Surf and leading to Seismitoad. I figured Sand Attack would be very useful here as well, since Earthquake is a super strong move, barely keeping Vaporeon alive as I max out. Swapping for Swan at a KO Seismitoad after setting up Tailwind, hitting two Bubble Beams and a Flying Gem boosted Air Slash to take it out. Half down, half to go, and Hydreigon is in fourth. My team's in pretty rough shape, but I swap for Jellicent, getting nailed with Dragon Rush, disabling it with the Curse Body ability as I pivot over to Walrein, missing Blizzard as he uses Rock Slide. Well, this is sad, but I at least have Lapras, swapping in on the Crunch and hitting Body Slam to Paralyze and barely survive a Rock Slide, living on 18 HP and finishing him off with Surf. Fifth out is Toxicroak, and Swan is perfect for handling this, one-shotting with Fly after taking Sucker Punch with Drapion as his last Pokemon. All of my Pokemon are at low HP, so I use Tailwind with Swanna, sacking it to Drapion so that Simipore can come in and KO with two Surfs, winning the match but with another death. I unfortunately am having a rapid succession of these, and it really sucks, but losing three Pokemon this back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back is kind of sloppy. I'm going to have to play very carefully to get through the victory road in the league because of this. The last problematic fight before the league, though, is actually a simple cool trainer inside of Victory Road that has a Durant and a Ferrothorn. I'm sure you've already pinpointed the problem, since Ferrothorn has an insanely strong attack in the form of Power Whip. A 120 power physical grass type attack that is just too much to handle with my team, except for maybe like Jellicent. This fight was so scary to me that I trained most of my team to level 61 while the cap was 62. I was that desperate to get through here without a fifth death, and sure enough, I made it through since he decides to be an idiot, going for ingrain and payback on Walrein as I KO with two blizzards. With that problem out of the way though, there is one more rival battle before I make it out alive. And I think I can do this, even though Superior is level 61. He leads with Unpheasant, so I start with Jellicent, going immediately for Surf as he gets off a critical Aerial Ace, being disabled off of Curse Body, but next turn he goes for Swagger. I hate this, severely, but Jellicent is able to not hit himself, healing back up to full with Recover, allowing me to just go for Surf next turn, but he goes for U-Turn, getting the heck out of dodge as Buffalon comes in. I'm not too threatened by this, so I just went for Rain Dance, tanking a relatively massive Wild Charge, but thanks to the recoil damage, Jellicent's able to pick up the first KO of the fight, putting me up 6 Pokemon to 3. Kinda wish that Hugh had 5 members on his team here, but honestly, I, since I have to contend with Superior, I'm perfectly fine with this. Next out is said Superior, so I take a big think and swap for Lapras. And unsurprisingly, she gets hit with a critical Leaf Blade, leaving me with no choice but to swap for Walrein. 
Fortunately for me, he gets greedy and goes for Coil, giving me the shot of KOing with Blizzard, which I do, leading to Simisir, a KO with Walrein Surf, leaving just his nearly dead on Pheasant, going down after I swap into Vaporeon and destroy it with one more Surf. Okay, thank goodness, no losses here, but now it is time for major preparation. First of all, I grabbed every single rare candy from around the region. The level cap of 62 is alleviated after the first league battle, so these will be handy to get as much advantage over the rest of the league and the champion as possible. I also made sure to grab a Pelipper from Route 13 as my encounter over there to replace Swana. It's not nearly as good, but it's at least the same type as Swana and can serve as a relatively perfect replacement. Next up on the list is resetting all of my Pokemon's EVs. There's an NPC over on Route 5 that gives you 5 of an EV reducing berry every day, so I just skipped day after day to get these, resetting my EV spreads, which I'll go over in the final team recap. And finally, I made sure to grab a bunch of different TMs so that I could optimize my Pokemon's movesets, as well as go to a few different move tutors and the move relearner in order to finish off everything. Alright, team recap time. First up, Vaporeon holding the Mystic Water with a spread of 128 HP, 128 Special Attack, and a 252 Special Defense EVs with the moveset Shadow Ball, Ice Beam, Scald, and Sand Attack. Sand Attack is still a very useful move for the occasional hard-to-out Pokemon. Shadow Ball is good coverage for Caitlyn's team when I don't want to worry about Jellicent going down, Ice Beam for Iris, and Scald for the good stab. Second up is Simipor, holding a Flying Gem with 6 HP, 252 Attack, and 252 Speed EVs, with the moveset Crunch, Acrobatics, Ice Punch, and Waterfall. Crunch is a super good coverage move for Caitlyn's team. Acrobatics is just broken on Marshall and Grimsley Scrafty, especially with the Flying Gem for extra power. Ice Punch for a physical ice move, which I got from a move tutor over in Driftvale City using red shards, and Waterfall in place of something like Surf or Scald, as Simipore's physical attack is indeed higher than its special attack. Third up on the team is Walrein holding a Splash Plate with 252 HP, 252 special attack, and 6 special defense EVs with the moveset Ice Beam, Rain Dance, Rest, and Surf. I figured Hail wouldn't be as useful if none of my Pokemon are going to be packing Blizzard, so I instead gave the slot to Rain Dance for everything in the party. Kind of wish I had given Walrein a Chesto Berry, but I was done looking for stuff to prep for this whole set of battles, and I didn't have any, so I said screw it. Fourth up is Lapras, holding a Scope Lens with 252 Special Attack, 4 Special Defense, and 252 Speed EVs, with the moveset Thunderbolt, Surf, Ice Shard, and Ice Beam. The Bolt Beam combo is classic, great coverage, Surf is amazing stab, and Ice Shard could potentially be useful priority if Lapras is at low HP and I don't want to try pivoting over to a new Pokemon to KO something. Fifth is Jellicent holding the Leftovers with 252 HP, 6 Defense, and 252 Special Defense EVs with the moves Shadow Ball, Energy Ball, Scald, and Recover. Energy Ball is a very nice coverage move. It's not amazing in this league, but Iris does have a Lapras, and I could see that coming in very handily against it. Scald and Shadow Ball are great stab, and Recover is fantastic for the long game. Last but not least, Pelipper, holding the Water Gem with 128 Defense EVs, 252 Special Attack, and 128 Special Defense EVs, with the moveset Ice Beam, Scald, Roost, and Tailwind. Very pleased to see that this one gets Tailwind as well, so it could serve the same purpose as Swana once did, and not to mention being able to heal off of Roost is great. I figure not having a flying move for attacking is fine, as Water and Ice should be plenty enough to deal with the occasional damage, but I'm not exactly sure how useful this one will be. I kinda guess we'll find out. Chantal's up first, and she leads with Cofagrigus, so of course I go for Vaporeon, trading Shadow Balls as I KO with the second, leading to Drift Limb. She goes for Psychic, so I hit Shadow Ball afterwards, doing the same next turn, KOing and leading to Chandelure, who takes Vaporeon down to 78 HP, but goes down to a single Scald, before she sends in her fourth Pokemon in Golurk. This isn't a problem since she's likely seen the KO with Earthquake here, so I just swapped for Pelipper, reading the AI correctly, and KOing with a Water Gem boosted Scald, leaving just Bayonet. I did also think about teaching this thing Hurricane, but it didn't come into play into my game plan. 
It used Sucker Punch as I went for Scald, burning it and doing over half as she heals with a full restore next turn, so I just do it again, this time not burning, but I swap for Wall Rain to play around criticals, with her missing a Will-O-Wisp and hitting a Shadow Claw as I KO with Surf, winning the first of five battles. Alright, good stuff, but here's where I realized that I forgot to stock up further on healing items. So I'm stuck with around a dozen and a half Hyper Potions, Max Potions, and Full Restores combined, but that should be enough to pull through and win this challenge. Think of it as an added bonus challenge. Also, now that I'm done with the first battle, I'm able to use my rare candies, getting three of my team members that leveled up during the fight to level 65 by using two candies each, moving on to Grimsley next. He leads with Lipard, so I start with Lapras, going for Ice Shard, but since she's faster- Wait, she? Hold up, pause. Pull up Grimsley's team over on Bulbapedia for challenge mode. Why is his whole team female Pokemon? Like, 99% of the time, if a trainer is a certain gender, so are their Pokemon. Heck, look at the rematch challenge mode team for Grimsley. They're all males! That's a pretty big oversight, but I will guess I'll get over it. Getting back to the battle, Lipard outspeeds Lapras as I go for Ice Beam, barely missing the one shot, but fortunately, I can just Ice Beam after he heals and finish it off with Ice Shard, leading to his Scrafty. Kinda have to swap on this one since there's no way I'm letting Lapras go down to a random fighting attack, so instead I swap for Simipore, as he misses Rock Tomb, and I just wipe the floor with him with Acrobatics, KOing and leading to Crocodile. It's a free two-shot with Waterfall, though Earthquake does nearly KO Simipore. Either way, fourth out is Absol, so I swap for Vaporeon and take an X-Scissor for very little damage, going for Scald next turn as I take Night Slash and do around half of my remaining HP as Scald burns, barely missing the KO, so I risk the Biscuit, staying in and going for Scald once more. Fortunately, he did not critical Vaporeon, going down and leaving just Bisharp. I figured swapping to Wall Rain here would be relatively safe, and he's able to take a Night Slash like a champion. So next turn I go for Surf, literally missing the KO by 1 HP as he lands a second Night Slash, but I stay in, taking a third and finishing his Bisharp off, winning the match, though it could have ended very poorly if I had gotten some particularly bad luck with Night Slash. A few rare candies and healing items later, and it's time for the third fight against Caitlyn. She leads with Masharna as I go for Jellison, going for Shadow Ball, doing half as she misses with Hypnosis. Well, sick, I'll take a free KO. The second Shadow Ball takes her down, leading to Gothitelle. So I swap for Vaporeon as she starts going for Calm Mind. Well, uh, that's not good, so after landing a single, very weak Shadow Ball, I started going for Sand Attack, lowering the accuracy just enough to where swapping for Jellison shouldn't be terrible. And sure enough, after a few attacks and a recover, I'm able to out this monster, leading to Reuniclus. Shadow Ball is another two-shot after tanking an Energy Ball, thank goodness for Reuniclus being mega slow, leading to Sigilith. It's barely doing any damage with Shadow Ball as I trade with it, using Recover for the next two turns to get back up to full and take one more Shadow Ball as I reciprocate with one of my own to KO and leave her with just Metagross. I decide that staying in would be the play, going for Scald after taking a Zen Headbutt. That, of course, flinches. Shocking, but holy moly, that is a lot of damage. So from here, I just started swapping around since Metagross is holding the Life Orb, doing a ton of extra damage, but draining its own HP. So I just started swapping back and forth between my Ice types and Pelipper to bait out Hammer Arms, getting Metagross to do over half to itself as she does another bit of damage to herself with a second Hammer Arm on Pelipper. But I just can't pull the trigger with Simipore. I think Bullet Punch KOs from the range that it got taken down to, and I don't think that I can afford to lose a Pokemon here. So I swap back for Lapras, taking the Bullet Punch, but I'm an absolute buffoon and use Ice Shard here. On the turn, that... she heals. I thought that uh, she wasn't in the healing range and that Ice Shard would KO from that range. How insanely stupid is that? I'm shocked that I just didn't lose this fight from here. Instead, I swapped back into Wall Rain and took another Bullet Punch, going for Surf and shockingly outspeeding, dodging a Hammer Arm as a second takes Metacros down, winning me the fight. Holy moly, that was the stupidest fight ever. Reminds me of 
well, not being an idiot and to actually do calculations mid-battle instead of just click buttons. Last up for the league is Marshall, and despite the fact that Sock has Sturdy, this shouldn't be a terribly hard fight. He leads with Throw, so I go for Jellicent, my best wall here. And since Curse Body is amazing, after hitting a Scald, he goes for Payback and disables himself, allowing me to go for Recover and continue to whittle away with Scald, eventually getting him down to red HP with three more Scalds, putting him in full Restore range, so I just heal with Recover and begin the dance again. This repeats back and forth for a little while longer, as I alternate between Scald and Recover, until I finally end up taking him down in three more Scalds, finally getting to Lucario. And for some ungodly reason, this thing has Calm Mind. So, he goes for that as I go for Scald again, unfortunately not getting the burn and lowering the damage on the second time I use it, because his special defense went up. He starts going for Shadow Ball next turn, though, barely not KOing Jellicent on his second usage as I go for Recover, getting Jellicent back up to a bit over half as I decide to swap for Pelipper. It's not like Aura Sphere can really do much to Pelipper, so he tanks a Psychic and Shadow Ball with 14 HP to spare, KOing with the Scald and leading to Conkeldur. Since I don't have anything to do with Pelipper anymore, I just swapped it out with Vaporeon as he misses with Stone Edge and burns himself with a Flame Orb. I knew I had to act fast in order to not get swept by this and bulk up, so Vaporeon outspeeds and lands Scald. By that point, I knew Conkeldur was no longer a threat, as the second connects after Vaporeon outspeeds again, KOing and leaving him with Mian Chao and Sock. He decides on the former, going for high jump kick for around half damage as I go for Scald, nearly KOing. But since I'm sure the AI sees the KO on Vaporeon with high jump kick, it's going to go for it. So I swap into Jellicent. So, it keeps going and crashes, effectively giving me a safe switch into his last Pokemon, Sock. Payback does a fair bit of damage, but it's not enough as Curse Body disables it and Scald does a wee bit under half. The only other attack he has that can hit Jellicent is Rock Slide, so I just click the Recover, and of course he flinches Jellicent. I swear this move has a 70% chance of flinching, so I have to swap out into Simipore. Nothing should be able to KO this thing though, and it doesn't, taking under half from his Rock Slide as I go for Acrobatics next turn, outspeeding, KOing, and winning the last of the League fights without a single casualty. Alright, well the Champion fight is here, and I've run out of healing items. I actually had to go into this fight with Pelipper at 14 HP because I figured out that I would at least, well, need a sacking Pokemon, and it wasn't like I was going to really be able to use it for much in this fight, so let's go for it. Iris leads with Hydreigon, so I go for Wall Rain, immediately getting nailed by Focus Blast for over half, but Ice Beam is able to come back and KO immediately, leading to Agron. Wall Rain outspeeds, KOing immediately with Surf, as he does the same with Ice Beam on Drudigan, quickly putting me up 6 Pokemon to 3. Well, shoot, good stuff, Wall Rain. Too bad I don't have a Chesto Berry, though, as I go for Rest, but Iris's Lapras is able to KO Wall Rain with the help of a Thunder, and then a Critical Thunder. So, upon the KO, I safely swapped over to Jellicent, going for Energy Ball as he dodged Sing, unfortunately not doing the same next turn. But Thunder does barely any damage to Jellicent, and to add insult to injury, disables it with Cursed Body, while forcing her to swap over to Hydro Pump. Jellicent wakes up next turn, finishing off Lapras with two more Scalds, as Haxorus and Archeops remain. She sends out the former, a foreboding threat with Dragon Dance and Outrage, but she instantly goes for Outrage, hitting and barely missing the KO as Curse Potty activates once again, letting Jellicent get off a Shadow Ball for nearly half as I realized, hey, she's locked into Outrage even though it's disabled, so I swap for Pelipper in the desperate hope to meme on Iris and KO her with a mostly dead bird, but it wasn't to be. Haxorus doesn't hit itself in confusion, instead KOing Pelipper with x Scissor and leaving me at an impasse. Oh, wait, not really. Lapras is able to just swoop in there, take the KO with Ice Beam after outspeeding, KOing with a critical no less, and it's all but guaranteed at this point. I have four Pokemon remaining on my team, she has one, and as Archeops comes in, I immediately click Surf, KOing in one shot after outspeeding, finishing off Archeops and becoming the champion. By the way, this was my first attempt 
I didn't lose a single time with this run, and I'm damn proud of it as my first completed Nuzlocke. Heck, this actually gives me confidence in trying more of these in the future, and I hope you look forward to some more, of course. Make sure to leave a comment, though, for some that you'd like to see in certain games, since I'm not an endless idea machine. Anyway, next week on the channel should be my first ever video in a Gen 2 game proper that's not the remakes, but I'll leave that video to be a surprise. See you guys next time. If you guys enjoyed the video, make sure to like, comment, subscribe, click the bell, tell a friend, and don't spend more than a minute doing that since if you are, you're taking too long. But first, I want to give a huge shout out to my $10 and above patrons, Kyle Campbell, Aiden Brannon, Richard Jackson, Michael Evans, and Justin Dimenstein. Thank you guys so much for your support. I really appreciate you all taking the time out of your day to watch this, and I'll see you guys next time with another challenge. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I'll see you next time.